Hello, and welcome to another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. On today's episode, we meet Molly Squidpidge, an intrepid reporter from the Malifaux Daily Record. She is about to be sent on the assignment of her life. I hope you enjoy Seamus Crashes a Funeral. Seamus Crashes a Funeral by Nicholas Volker I see that you've discovered the prize of this exhibit, Miss Squidpidge. You have a good eye. The curator approached where Molly was setting up her camera. It's a very striking piece. I hope you don't mind if I take a shot of it. I think it will look great in the article. Molly paused and pulled her head out from beneath the camera's hood. And please call me Molly. What can you tell me about this piece? It's called The Gorgon's Tear. It's among the first relics recovered from the ruins of Malifaux during the initial expeditions through the breach, before it closed. Bernard Hughes, the adventurer who found it, claimed a fanciful tale of prying the stone from the statue of a serpent goddess he discovered in the wilderness. There's not much supporting evidence for his tale, as no other members of the expedition recall seeing such a statue, and it's never been recovered. Also, the Hughes family crest incorporates an image of Athena's aegis, which depicts a woman's face and wreath of snakes. It's more likely that he named the stone in an attempt to link it to his family's name. You ask me, though, it's a fitting name for the stone regardless. The green glow reminds me of a serpent's venom or the gaze of that petrifying monster of ancient myth. The stone has earned a myth of its own as well, which makes it even more valuable aside from its great size and arcane potency. The stone is said to be cursed. Hughes was an eccentric man, but he became increasingly more paranoid as he grew older. He feared that the creatures of Malifaux had followed him back through the breach, earthside, to reclaim the stone. He never parted from the gem, and had it cut into its present teardrop shape and set in the pendant that you see here. He wore it on his person at all times, though rarely openly hiding it beneath his shirt or jacket. His daughter's husband was one of those unfortunate souls who were trapped in Malifaux when the breach collapsed, leaving Hughes's daughter a widow and his granddaughter Harriet without a father. Hughes's daughter and granddaughter moved to live with him at his estate, where he lived in the giant mansion, alone with only a small staff to maintain it. Harriet had dark eyes and jet black hair, in his paranoia, Hughes was convinced this little girl was a never-born monster that had finally tracked him down to steal the tear from him. He was constantly blaming the girl for any and all mishaps that occurred at the estate and became easily agitated and violent. His fear of the little girl eventually motivated him to set fire to the Hughes estate. He, his daughter and granddaughter, were all found burned alive, together in the same room. The gorgon's tear was found on Hugh's body. The staff that escaped the fire said that the stone glowed brighter than ever, charged by the deaths of Hughes and his family. Hughes left no will, and the stone was sold at an estate auction. From there, the stone passed through several different owners. Each suffered tragic deaths, and the stone was always present at the death of its owner, continuously energised by the grim fates of its masters. With each death, the stone's infamy grew. Only those with a morbid interest in the macabre history of the tears still sought it. Eventually, it ended up in the possession of a Mr. Dorian McKee, a land surveyor who won a contract in the Malifaux marshlands upon the reopening of the breach. He disappeared a few weeks after arriving in Malifaux. The establishment suspected foul play, and death marshals were dispatched to investigate. Mr. McKee's partially digested body and the gorgon's tear were recovered from the belly of a strange crocodile-like creature caught in the marsh. And that's what brings the stone to this archive's collection. 
With no will and no next of kin, the stone was relinquished to become state's property. The governor decided to donate it to this collection. He, of course, had no right to keep it. The only other course of action would have been an estate auction, much like what happened in Hughes's case. However, I like to think that the governor donated it because he feared the curse of the stone. It makes a much better tale, if you ask me. Molly lifted her hand and held out the flash pan. In her other hand, she pushed the shutter button and a brilliant sulphur flash filled the room. Lifting her head from behind the camera again, Molly looked into the darkness behind the tear's display case. She narrowed her eyes. Is there someone over there? But the figure she thought she saw through the camera lens was no longer there. Yes, yes, there is. Miss, miss. Molly looked over her shoulder at the woman the curator was addressing. This woman was clearly not the figment Molly imagined seeing in the viewfinder. Her clothes were unmistakable. The woman was dressed in a slinky red gown that appeared to have seen better days. The hem was tattered and soiled, and she had her parasol open indoors, spinning idly on her shoulder. The curator's boots sounded harshly on the tiled floor, echoing loudly in this vaulted chamber of the Malifaux City archive, Miss, miss, the curator continued, stopping behind the woman who was leaning against one of the glass displays. He reached out and tapped her on the shoulder. Miss, this area of the archive is closed to visitors right now. The exhibit will open in the morning if you'd like to. The curator's voice trailed off. The woman turned slowly, revealing flesh as pale as moonlight. Seeing her slender throat, Molly thought of a tiny ivory sculpture she once saw. But the woman's face was terrible, and the curator sucked in a short gasp at the sight of her. Glassy eyes were set in dark, sunken sockets, and her thin lips revealed a rotten smile of jagged, decayed teeth. The parasol tumbled from the woman's shoulder and rolled silently into the middle of the floor. The curator couldn't take his eyes off the woman's face, she snarled like an animal and with a sudden lunge toppled the curator over onto his back. She was on him in an instant. Her mouth sunk into him as a predator and she silenced his cry by ripping out his throat. Her pale face was splashed by a crimson spout of blood. Turning her head, she spit out the mouthful of gore onto the floor and set her corpse eyes on Molly. Beside Molly, the gorgon's tear flashed with a malevolent green light flaring in response to the curator's death. The reporter acted quickly, producing a derringer from her inside jacket pocket. Her weapon cracked twice, but with little result. The bullet struck true, one severing the strap of the monster's ruined gown, causing the bodice to fall crooked across its chest. However, no blood was produced by the weapon, just two black holes like ink spots. Molly saw that the monster was not alone, Behind her, two other women appeared, and the three set upon the dead curator, tearing his flesh from his body. Molly reeled and stumbled backward, her mind dizzy with the gruesome scene before her. Her foot caught on the corner of the rug and she began to fall backward, tumbling into the unexpected embrace of a man. He spoke softly and with a heavy accent. Oh, love, don't worry, or you won't let them eat you. His voice attempted comfort, but his words struck a new chord of terror inside Molly. He whispered, They know to leave the pretty ones for me. With a sudden motion, the man plunged a long blade through the woman's back. She watched as a blade emerged from her chest with a horrible tearing sound. The blade pierced her lung so that she couldn't scream. Instead of voice, blood came to her lips and she could only gurgle weakly in response to her murderer. Her body stilled, and Seamus laid her carefully on the ground, kneeling beside her. His fingers combed through Molly's silky hair, pushing her hat with its press pass aside. With gentle attention, his fingertips traced the contours of the expired woman's face, admiring her as if she were a sculpture. His thumb brushed lightly across her blood-stained lips, and he made a soft, happy sigh at the sensation. Seamus gazed into Molly's lifeless eyes and bowed his head over her, whispering, You are a lovely one, aren't you? 
His lips touched hers in a loving kiss. Her lips were soft, like delicate rose petals, and her blood like dew on a warm summer morning. In the background, Seamus could hear the faint sound of rushing footfalls approaching. He knew it was the sound of the marshal's boot heels. Somehow they were alerted to the violence here. He cupped Molly's cheek, smiling warmly. Don't worry, love. All Seamus will come back for you. I promise you that, love. He stood, and his undead entourage collected around him. One held the Gorgon's tear, while another held Molly's camera. He always took a souvenir to remember his victims. Seamus looked at them and nodded. Right, right. Let's go. I had the great fortune of working with Molly professionally. She was creative, intelligent, passionate. I wish that I had even an ounce of her passion. I was always envious of her adventures. As an editor, I was always stuck in the office. But I got to live vicariously through her words. If you are anything like me, you look forward to her column every week, to discover what new treasure she'd unearthed, what mystery she solved, or what exotic location she visited. I think her stories brought a lot of joy to a lot of people's lives. I'd like to share my favourite article of hers with you now. It's my favourite because I remember the day she told me the story herself, and I remember smiling at how excited she was to tell it. Frank Ginther, the editor of the Malifaux Daily Record, shuffled through his notes and found the newspaper clipping of Molly's story. He lifted his head and gazed out over the dozens of gathered mourners. He didn't know even half of them, but he was sure that Molly had been a treasured part of each of their lives. But she had that effect on people. She was naturally charismatic, and people couldn't help but admire her. Frank looked down at the clipping, adjusted his glasses and began to read. After the christening gala, Captain Clark invited his guests to join him that evening aboard the Erebus. This was the maiden voyage of the first ship ever constructed on this side of the breach, and I felt obligated and privileged to witness this historic event. The boilers produced a faint rumbling vibration on deck, and the turbines made an oddly soothing whir. There were a number of things unique about the vessel that set it apart from ships that fly sails, one, it was incredibly responsive and would accelerate and decelerate quickly, requiring me to hold fast at the rail for the entire voyage. The sea itself was curious as well. The setting sun produced an odd colour in the waves, and looking over the side it seemed as if the clear blue water transitioned abruptly into black ink just a few metres down. There was a motion in that inky water that startled me, and off the port side of the ship, an enormous creature catapulted out of the sea. It hung in the air for a moment, and I called out for everyone to look. Its bulk eclipsed the light of the setting sun, but the sun dimly filtered through its translucent body, like light through a curtain. Watching the creature disappear into the sea, we all talked excitedly. We decided that the best way to describe it was as an animal with the shape and manner of a dolphin, but flesh like a jellyfish, even complete with luminous, trailing tentacles. Captain Clark commented that he'd never seen a creature like it before, and suggested that I should name it. I thought about it for a long moment and chose to call it a Calypso, because such wonders as that creature could easily convince me to stay at sea for the rest of my days. The man folded the article and tucked it into his breast pocket. This was just one of her many adventures, and one of the many examples that demonstrates to me how Molly lived more in one day than many of us do in our entire lives. I suggest each of you, when an adventure presents itself, do not turn away. Remember Molly, and think of what she m Frank's face went suddenly flush, and he quickly crossed himself. Good Lord! The guests turned their heads following Frank's gaze to the back of the crowd. There, three women stood, their faces as pale as moonlight. On the ground in front of them lay an officer with a folded parasol planted in his back. Gunshots rang out, 
and the crowd darted out of their seats, screaming in terror. As they scattered, the women set upon the remaining two officers, who frantically fired their revolvers into their attackers' unfeeling flesh. As if from nowhere, Seamus bowled over the eulogist and leapt onto the casket, spinning on his heels with a flourish. He cupped his hands around his mouth and called out, Please stay. I want to say a few words on Miss Squidpidge's behalf. Throwing his head back, he let out a maddened laugh at his own joke. I only met her once, but I would have liked an opportunity to know her. Biblically, you know what I mean, lad. Frank looked up at the devil on the casket, and behind him the rotten bells continued to cause chaos in the dispersing crowd. Seamus drew from his side what appeared at first glance to be a saber. He held the weapon aloft, pointing it at the heavens. It was more than a sword, though. Above the guard, integrated into the blade, was a clamp that closed via a bolt that ran through the grip and out the pommel of the sword. Set in the clamp was a brilliant green, teardrop-shaped soulstone. Seamus shot into the air and brought the sword crashing down on the casket, bursting it into a shower of splinters. Covering his face with his arm, Frank muttered desperate prayers to himself. Before him lay the lifeless body of Molly Squidpitch among the wreckage of her coffin. Despite the cacophony of noise and violence around her, she looked so peaceful. Seeing her, it was difficult for him to believe her dead and not simply sleeping. He felt the urge to go to her, to shake her, to wake her and beg for her to flee. He wondered if when Seamus killed him, he would feel such peace. My boy, Seamus called out, you're going to want to see this. I told you, Molly, that I'd be back for you. He spun the blade above his head and with a sudden motion ran Molly through. It struck her with a sound like an axe on wood and the stone in the blade flashed with green flame. Molly's corpse sucked in a quick breath and her dead arm shot up to grip the blade that pinned her to the ground. Her eyes opened, and Frank saw that they were hollow and black, like the pit of hell. He screamed, madness gripping his body, and his hands tore at his clothes as he watched these unnatural events unfold. The woman looked up at Seamus and struggled against the blade. Her legs kicked at the ground as she tried to regain her feet, but her killer was standing stoic over her. Finally, Seamus knelt, and from a bag set at his feet, he produced a large photograph. He leaned over the squirming corpse of Molly Squidpitch and cruelly gripped her chin, craning her head to look at the photograph. It was the picture she had taken at the archive. In the centre was a tall, slender display case and the emerald gorgon's tear. In the background was a ghostly figure. Her frame was feminine and attractive, she wore an intricate Victorian gown with large layered skirts and a corseted bodice worn off the shoulders. Above those shapely shoulders, though, was a face wrought in nightmare. About her head was a mass of tangled serpents showing poisonous fangs and forked tongues. Fortunately, her eyes were cast in shadow by that crown of snakes. Her gaze was not something a sane man would wish to know. The photo had captured her terrible black smile, her expression communicated a simple fact. She knew. This shade of a woman. She knew a secret. Who is this? Who is this woman, dear Molly, dear Molly? Seamus demanded, shoving the photograph into the dead woman's face. Her cold hand clutched Seamus's wrist, and with the strength of death pushed the picture out of her way so that she might look at his face. I know her. Molly grinned, that same knowing grin. I know her, the corpse replied. She is there, in the darkness. I have seen her. Seamus gripped Molly's wrist in return, and with his other arm drew the saber from her belly. He dragged her to her feet and said sternly, You're coming with me. Then, calling out to his macabre harem, We're leaving. Obediently, the women stopped their feasting and hurried after their master. His eyes wide with persistent alarm, Frank watched, too scared to blink until they were out of sight, as the five walked away from the cemetery 
and toward the city. That's it for another episode of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure.